Hi, everybody. Welcome to um, our uh, sustaining conversation. It's really exciting for us. Um, who knows? We're going to put this on YouTube, and who knows when you're watching this. But for us, this is the last of our sustaining conversations that we've had this year. We um, have been doing this as a continuing conversation after our summer conference in 2021, where we did um, Sustaining Church, Reimagining Communities of Faith in a Climate Emergency. And the sustaining conversation has been these ongoing conversations. And we've had a whole range of amazing topics um, and, uh, and, and chats. And they've been really good. Everything from young people to um, divesting from fossil fuels to just, yeah, a whole range of amazing things. And so tonight is our last of these conversations. And we've really enjoyed them. Equally, it's the last of our potting shed. So all the groups that have um, come through our potting shed this is the last kind of uh, time for them as well. And so we're, we kind of did a little say farewell last night as a, or last week as it was the last with just us, but uh, we finished our first potty shed, which has been just an amazing time uh, together as well. So we'll do some announcements at the end, but um, I want to introduce our guest tonight. And we're so lucky to have uh, Mark, Nam and Ray along. I'll, I'll uh, introduce Ray first. Ray, um, I've only met a couple months ago. Um, has it been, Ray, has it even been a year yet? I don't think it has, um, but we've become fast friends. And when I met Ray, he had only just resettled um, in the UK um, from Hong Kong, maybe within a month. So it was weeks um, in which we met and we became fast friends. And he's become a real key member of Hazelnut Community Farm here in Bristol. He's one of our new trustees. And um, he's a man of wisdom and faith. And he's uh, also just been a great connection to all of our new friends from Hong Kong who are resettling in the Bristol area and have been able to come along to our garden. So it's we're really excited to hear from Ray as well. And I'll let him tell you a little bit more about his kind of background in nuclear work and Greenpeace, the amazing stuff he does. Um, also I wanna introduce uh, Mark and I'm gonna hand it over to him in a second. Mark and I met at Trinity College in Bristol where we trained together. And then I started my curacy. He was doing a placement there. And then he started a curacy. And we just moved on from uh, just continue to be friends. And uh, Mark has started Tea House as well, which is advocating uh, for diversity within ordination within the Church of England. And he's a man of God and a good friend. And so we're really glad to have him in here as well. So um, basically, that's me. And I'm going to hand it over to Mark and Ray now. And they're going to take it away. So um, over to you. All right, hey everyone, I'm gonna share my screen. I think on the settings you can have it so you can see like the PowerPoint on one side and my face on the other. Or if you don't wanna see my face, you can just see the PowerPoint, um, which is even better. So I'm just gonna do that now. Can someone just indicate whether you can see the PowerPoint? Yeah, great. And uh, again, just before I begin, um, I'm just recovering from COVID. I, I have a, a pretty bad cough. So sorry if I end up spluttering um, a little bit, but it's really good uh, to be joining this particular sustaining uh, conversation. And thanks for having me. Now, John has asked, will ask me if I'd be up for sharing some thoughts on, I think that the, the, the title was A Common Voice. All right, Diversity in Community and Nature. That was the title. And the minute I saw it, my mind went straight to a psalm. It went to Psalm 104. And the reason for that is Psalm 104 is one of the longest biblical accounts of non-human creation. And so it gives a voice to the community of creation, a common voice. And as you'll see, Psalm 104 is full of diversity in nature. So I thought we could begin this time by just reading through it and allowing God's word just to kind of sink in our hearts before we start talking about biodiversity and um, creation. You might be wondering why I chose this and not Job 38 and 39. And the main reason is they're quite similar, but with the Job passages, um, you know, it, it seems a lot more harsh on humanity for trying to be superior. Whereas when you read Psalm 104, and I hope this becomes clear, uh, the, the, the sense is more kind of encouraging us to be at one with uh, creation and actually has a more worshipful doxology kind of kind of with it, which I think is more helpful for reflections. Um, so let's have a look at Psalm 104. So this is the word of the Lord. 
Praise the Lord, O my soul. Lord my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendour and majesty. The Lord wraps himself in light as with a garment. He stretches out the heavens like a tent and lays the beams of his upper chambers on their waters. He makes the clouds his chariot and rides on the wings of the wind. He makes wind his messengers, flames of fire his servants. He sets the earth on its foundations. It can never be moved. You covered it with the watery depths and with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. Sorry. Yep. But at your rebuke, the waters fled. At the sound of your thunder, they took to flight. They flowed over the mountains. They went down into the valleys, to the place you assigned for them. You set a boundary they cannot cross. Never again will they cover the earth. He makes springs pour out into the ravines. It flows between the mountains. They give water to all the beasts of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. The birds of the sky nest by the waters. They sing among the branches. He waters the mountains from his upper chambers. The land is satisfied by the fruit of his work. He makes grass grow for the cattle and plants for people to cultivate, bringing forth food from the earth, wine that gladdens human hearts, oil to make their face shine, and the bread that sustains their hearts. The trees of the Lord are well watered, the cedars of uh, Lebanon that he planted. There the birds make their nests, and the stoke has its home in the junipers. The high mountains belong to the wild goats. The crags are a refuge for the hyrax. He made the moon to mark the seasons, and the sun knows when to go down. You bring darkness, it becomes night, and all the beasts of the forest prowl. The lions roar for their prey and seek their food from God. The sun rises and they steal away. They return and lie down in their dens. Then people go out to their work, to their labour until evening. How many are your works, O Lord? In wisdom you made them all. The earth, the earth is full of your creatures. There is the sea, vast and spacious, teeming with creatures beyond number, living things both large and small. There the ships go to and fro, the Leviathan where you formed to frolic there. All creatures looked to, oops, sorry, my screen's there. All creatures look to you to give them their food at the proper time. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hands, they are satisfied with good things. When you hide your face, they are terrified. When you take away their breath, they die and return to the dust. When you send your spirit, they are created and renew the face to of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. He who looks at the earth and uh, it trembles, who touches the mountains and the smoke. I will sing to the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. And may my meditation, that's what we're doing, be pleasing to him as I rejoice in the Lord. But may sinners vanish from the earth and the wicked be no more. Praise the Lord, my soul. Praise the Lord. Amen. Okay, quite a chunky piece of scripture. But again, as I said, one of the longer passages about predominantly non-human creation. And I want to use it to speak a little to biodiversity. All right, you're probably aware this is a relatively new word. And according to the conservation biologist, Stuart Pym, it only gained common use in 1986 after the American National Forum of Biodiversity and the 1992 Convention on Biological Diversity defines it as, and I think this is helpful for us, the variability among living organisms, including into alien terrestrial, marine and other aquatic ecosystems and the ecological complexities of which they are a part. And this includes, and there's that word, diversity, and we'll be coming back to that, within species uh, between species and of ecosystems. You know, you'd be forgiven for thinking that this is a description of the psalm that we just read together. Now, when it comes to biodiversity, which we'll be looking at, uh, biodiversity conservation, sorry, Fred Van Dyke points out that scientific and goal rational approaches 
to biodiversity or conservation consistently fail to frame biodiversity conservation as a moral endeavor and without a moral framework uh, even the most elaborate of schemes will fail to make a lasting impact so we need so experts are saying we need something more and i think most of us know that and i agree with kyle van houten who says to succeed as a social cause conservation needs a cultural legitimacy okay that inspires enthusi enthusiasm allegiance and personal sacrifice in other words actual changes in human behavior and so for this kind of success to occur biodiversity conservation must be embedded in a system of values that can provide affirmation for the intrinsic value of biodiversity that is being conserved and that was I think said so beautifully and poetically in Psalm 104. And that's why I believe that the Christian worldview has something of real value to offer conversations around biodiversity. And it's really important that we engage with this aspect of creation care, because you're probably aware that COP 15 part two is coming up. It was meant to be last month, but it got canceled. And this is where leaders will meet face to face in Kunming, China, to finalize the adoption of the post 2020 global diversity framework. We've been working on it for the past couple of years. COVID kind of slowed it down, but it's back on track. And if, if, as we've just heard, that science and technology on their own are not enough to reverse the degradation of biodiversity, and I would say it isn't, then as the church, okay, we must speak up into this area. All right, but to do that, we, we kind of, we need a good understanding, a good grasp of what the Bible has to say. You know, how do we ensure that what we have maintains its saltiness? How do we ensure that what we have, you know, adds something unique to the conversations? And um, I guess I don't have too much time to go in depth today, but I wanted maybe to give a little quick overview, a, a, very, a very quick one, what the Bible might have to say about biodiversity so that it arms us, um, equips us, to at least bring something positive to the conversations, because we'll be hearing a lot more about biodiversity, I believe, in the coming years. So if you take a quick look at the Bible, uh, Genesis 1, you'll know that there's a clear taxonomy of animal species, and it's divided into four categories. Okay, you've got uh, creatures of the sea, um, which is kind of there. You have flying creatures of the sky. You also have what are known as high carriage animals, and then crawlies. And actually, the Hebrew actually translates as crawlies, okay? That crawl on the ground. That's the four of them. And this taxonomy is repeated um, in Deuteronomy, where there's a prohibition of the manufacture of images. And again, just to show you there, it says, you can see the four um, right there. Any animal on the earth, or any bird that flies in the air, or any creatures that move along the ground, or any fish in the waters. You've got that fourfold division being made. And, you know, there's a lot more in the Old Testament canon, but even if you fast forward to the, the other end of the Bible, John envisages a quartet, and that's significant, of living creatures around the heavenly throne in Revelation that offers ceaseless praise to God. And John declares expressly that he heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them, saying to the one seated on the throne and to the lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever. Um, and ever. I think I've got that right there. Yep. So the vision of a redeemed cosmos includes all creatures with all their territorial and biological diversity, giving eternal praise to the creator. And again, that's something that, you know, as Christians, we believe is part of uh, the reason why creation was formed to offer that praise, which isn't part of I suppose, everyday secular discussions on biodiversity. So again, a diverse community of voices, which is tonight's topic for sustaining conversations. And the Bible recognizes that the degradation of the environment through loss of biodiversity robs the cosmic choir of voices, basically, to praise Yahweh. And I, I got that phrase from um, a Richard Borkham. Now, returning to Psalm 104, which is how we began our reflection, what I find particularly interesting 
is that God's provision for all of these living creatures can be put into six categories. Just very quickly. First, we have the breath of life in verse 29. And this is life itself, the fundamental gift that underlies all others. And in verse 30, I love this. He sent his spirit, his breath, to renew the face of the ground. So actually, there's much to be said about pneumatology when we talk about biodiversity. I haven't got time to go there tonight. But number two, water. This is essential for all life, and it's prominent in verses 10, 13, um, 16. Number three, Psalm 104 talks about food. In verse 28, all creatures look to you, God, to give them their food in the proper time. Number four, habitat, because it mentions water, trees by water for birds, mountains for mountain goats, rocky crags for hyrax, arable land for humans, forests for lions and many others, sea, sea for the creatures of the ocean and so on. You know, and as we think about biodiversity, we think about the systems that help the world survive and, and regulate. And you have times and seasons, the alternation of day and night, the regularity of the seasons of the year are essential aspects of the Earth's habitality for living creatures. And we know, I mean, I, I was saying to Kai, ev every spring, I feel like summer's getting earlier and earlier. All right. The times and the seasons are crucial to the uh, climate care. And finally, I love this one. It's joy. It's joy. The life God gives and resources isn't just for utilitarian survival, but has its goal in God's creatures enjoying life. Verse 12, the birds sing for joy. And then in verse 15, God's provision for humans includes wine, fruit of the earth, isn't it? Grapes to gladden the heart and oil to make the face shine. All of these things represent the different and complex ecosystems and patterns that comprise the Earth's biodiversity and indeed diversity in general. So the Bible clearly indicates the interrelatedness and interdependence of all living creatures and ecosystems on Earth, including us, humanity. And it's worth bearing in mind that humanity was created on the same day as the animals. We're not necessarily superior to other creatures, but we do have a role to play, a specific role uh, in relation to it as members of one body, so to speak. And um, I think I gave a talk at last year's um, Hazelnut Conference about what East Asian um, perspectives can give uh, to the theology of creation care. And, you know, one of the things I say is that in, um, in Western Enlightenment categories of thought, um, it kind of separates us from creation, doesn't it? It's, it's us and them. Whereas in Eastern modes of thought, it's a lot more synergistic. And so arguably the church in the West needs some reconfiguring and places like Hazelnut are helping that thinking happen. And really we need to provide a biblical teaching that provides a framework uh, which can talk about the importance of biodiversity and living as one, living in, in a synerg synergetic relationship with creation. And I often talk about a theology of yin and yang as being a category of theological thought and enabling that. And towards the end of Psalm 104, after instancing many species and stressing their diversity, the psalmist brings them, and I love this, brings them all together, humans and other creatures alike, in their common dependence. And this is important if we're trying to offer a biblical point of view, a common dependence on the creator. Psalm 104 is a picture of an ecological creation belonging within a theocentric praise, okay, as opposed to an anthropocentric one, one that focuses on us, of God for his creation. I think that's what distinguishes a Christian approach to biodiversity. We are to be a community of creation and a diverse one. Wendell Berry, who many of you will have read, speaks of humans as creatures of God and members of the holy community of creation, doesn't he? And what I'm going to do is pass over to Ray now, uh, who I believe is going to explore the idea of diversity uh, a little further, a little more, with some thoughts and reflections around 1 Corinthians 12 and his experiences of diversity in community and nature. So over to you, Ray. Oh, thanks, Mark. Yeah, I'm uh, quite enjoying listening to your presentation. And good evening, everyone. Uh, there's a saying that no two snowflakes are alike. 
science help us to understand whether it's true or false. There are three key facts. First, snowflakes take different shapes depending on the weather conditions. I'm not going to elaborate that. So snowflakes falling at one place at the time look like each other. Another fact is that on the macroscopic scale, two snowflakes can appear identical in shape and size. Since a group of snowflakes falling in the same time from, from under, form under similar conditions, there's a decent chance if you look at enough snowflakes, two or more will look the same to the naked eyes or under a light microscope. If you compare snow crystals at the early stage of formation before they have had a chance to branch out much, the odds that two of them might look alike is high. However, this is the third fact that the in the at the molecular and atomic level, snowflakes differ in terms of number of at atoms and isotope ratio. Therefore, it's fair to say sometimes two snowflakes look alike, especially if they are simple shapes. But if you examine any two snowflakes closely enough, each will be unique. Okay, if you are interested in why and how, there are many scientific papers available for, for more details. This evening, I'm here to share some stories with you. So I'm not going to take up your time for a scientific lecture, uh, lecture on snowflakes. But I find it so interesting, so exciting and interesting to know the richness of creation that even snowflake crystals be made differently in a wonderful way. Before I'm going to tell a story about an old friend of mine, Peter Harris, the founder of a faith-based organization in Russia, uh, I'd do a little bit more self-introduction. Uh, My name is Lei Yuting. I was born in mainland China. Here I say mainland China to distinguish it to the city of Hong Kong, where I have been living for 10 years with my family before we moved to Bristol in the UK since July last year in 2021. Um, unlike British names, Chinese people put the family name in the front. So my family name is Lei, L-E-I, and my given name is Yu Ting. And I'm also known as Ray, as my English name that uh, my colleagues and friends uh, would like to call me. I'm working with Greenpeace. Yeah, uh, John mentioned that as a campaigner, a researcher, and an activist in different roles uh, and different environmental issues. Um, ranging from uh, climate change, um, plastics, um, and forest, to investigating and dealing with uh, various kinds of hazardous materials, including radiological, radiological um, uh, hazard. Uh, now my family and I are living in the UK. I'm uh, involved in the hazelnut community farm to grow and share food and to worship on the garden farm together with a group of local British people and people from Hong Kong. Back to 2013, when I have been working with Greenpeace for six years already, I felt frustrated and struggled. And it was such a comfort to meet with Peter and Miranda Harris in Hong Kong. At that time, I was frustrating after investigating into many heartbroken environmental destructions and uh, bearing witness in terrifying uh, pollution sites in China and in different places of the world. As a Christian, I was also struggled whether it's a right path to work in a quite a diversified environmental organization. And it is usually perceived as a radical group. And there are only a few Christians working in it. Uh, I could say quite a few. 
By that time, Peter and Miranda had founded uh, Arasha and operated globally for 30 years since 1983. Peter listened to my frustration and the struggling, and then he shared with uh, me his story about campaigning against a local powerful developer in Portugal. Peter basically opened for me the scene of a big picture and the higher purpose of creation care beyond the environmental protection work itself. In an interview, Peter made the comment that it's important to understand that a Russia as a movement is driven by biblical theology. It is not a Christian attempt to save the planet. It's a response to who God is and the creation care. Pete, and for creation care, Peter's insight is that uh, it is a calling that can become second nature. The single expression of normal Christian living and worship. I read from one of the um, books he wrote that this caring for creation has spontaneously taken a number of widened uh, various forms as could be expected for Christians who live and work in such a wide variety of contexts around the world. Almost daily, it seems that new incarnations of Christian life are taking shape in all kinds of different communities. In green or city spaces, in stands of trees, of rare trees, or in new expanse of precious freshwater wetlands. It is beginning to look at almost too multicolored and creative to discern the common threats, but some shared commi commitments are emerging within the lives of many involved in this work, and we would like to make them more widely known. They have to do with a closer hold on community and a deeper search for the relationships that must lie behind the tactics and the techniques of environmentally concerned. They appear out of the wisdom of different cultures renewed in Christ and are seen in the strength of, the, of his impress of the broken hearted. hearted. So I read this uh, from the, the book um, Peter wrote, uh, The Kingfisher's Fire, a story of hope for God's hope. Yeah. Unlike Peter, um, who was born and grew up in Western countries, I was born in China, speaking Mandarin as my mother tongue, growing up in a mountainous and a foggy city of Chongqing, southwest part of China. Uh, yeah, which is famous of spicy food and uh, hot summers. And when I, wait, when I met with Peter, I was living in Hong Kong, a compacted modern city where people speak in Cantonese and are always busy and are working restlessly. Despite all the differences, such as age, place of birth, languages, and of course, totally different background we grew up and the difference of two organizations we work with. Peter and I shared more in commonalities than differences regarding to creation care in the Lord of Jesus Christ. Isn't it amazing? And uh, this reminds me of the Bible verses in the first Corinthians chapter 12, that it is one body, but it has many parts, but all its many parts make up one body. It is the same with Christ. We were all baptized by one Holy Spirit. And so we are formed into one body. It didn't matter whether we were Jews or Gentiles, slaves or free people. We were all given the same spirit to drink. So the body is not made up of just one part. It has many parts. Another small and beautiful story I'd like to share here with you is about hazelnut community farm I'm involved in. 
The first time I got to know the hazelnut community farm was in August last year. As John mentioned, yeah, just one month after we, uh, our family moved uh, to the UK. Uh, another friend, David Good, uh, also one of the trustees of uh, Hazelnut, my local friend and uh, and a local tutor for my crest study in Bristol introduced us to the farm. Um, yeah, he aimed to welcome us and show us around in a new place. My family and I found Hazelnut Community Farm a peaceful and a joyful place that reminded us back in Hong Kong. We sometimes went to a small local farm running by a friend there. And uh, I started to introduce the Hazelnut Community Farm to more friends from Hong Kong. And more and more people from Hong Kong enjoyed coming to the farm. Yeah, uh, every Sunday afternoon. Here in the Hazelnut, I'm not only enjoying and learning from the ex experience of putting my hands in soil to grow food, but also um, through the gardening work, I'm reaching out and getting to know more people from different background come to the to the farm. It is it is more than a site for welcoming people from different places to come to grow and share food together. It is also a church of communion in Jesus Christ. We all know that we are facing climate emergency and the food price is rising and they might have food shortage um, in near future soon. How then shall we live? Are we going to fight with each other to protect the self-interest of the individual or our own organization? Or we can take an alternative approach to live in generosity and abundance here, um, I read an article that uh, the doctor uh, named uh, Kathleen Ellen. He, she actually researched and found that nature would teach us that there's another way of operating a system. One that's not based on scarcity, but on abundan abundance and the generosity. As ecosystems in involves in nature, they become more diverse. This diversity creates more resources, not less in a system. This is because diverse plants and the species need different nutrients to thrive. And they each generate abundant resources that they can share. They soon realize that uh, they can gain what they need by creating cooperative relationships. Instead of uh, drawing all their resources from the soil, they started to exchange resources from with other species or plants. This shift from competitive to cooperative relationship creates the conditions for a system based on abundance. So this is basically this is about me and uh, my two more stories. I will pass it to Mark. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks for sharing. And there's such beautiful imagery, you know, in the snowflakes from 1 Corinthians and just what's happening on our doorstep in Hazelnut Community Farm. Um, thank, thanks for sharing that. I'm just going to share my screen again. All right. And I thought um, I could pick up on some of the points that Ray shared and offer just another short hermeneutic that I believe really stresses the importance of diversity in community and by extension in nature or the whole community of creation that we've been talking about. And I was just thinking as well as I share this, you know, it's worth us thinking about the intersectionality in terms of racial justice. And just let me quickly explain. Ray talked about how important it is to see beyond our differences and how we can cooperate together. And ultimately, if we're really going to make a difference, we need to cooperate together as nature teaches us. But we have so many divides in our society. One of the main ones, as we know, 
is racial divides. And I just have this feeling that actually we have to think intersectionally about creation care, biodiversity and racial justice. And so speaking about uh, diversity uh, is important both in creation, but also across racial divides in finding out how we can actually work together cooperatively, as, as, as Ray said. Um, so again, if we return to the Bible uh, and the start of the Bible, I believe that there is a scriptural basis for redemption, okay, in general, and can be found at the very beginning in the words uttered by God upon completion of creation. He said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Now, these words on your screen were God's command, all right, or mandate for creation to multiply and disperse across the entire earth. That is what we're supposed to do. Okay, that is his original design. Now, when you read this verse, I I'm guilty for this, we usually only associate it with humanity. But if you look more closely at the text, you come to realize that it is in fact addressed to everything he made on that day. Remember, I mentioned that humanity was made on the same day as creation. So this mandate also applies to land based creatures he made in verses 24 and 25. And just before that, he creates the birds of the air and creatures of the sea and he even says to them <coughs> specifically, be fruitful and increase in numbers and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase in the earth. And yet we're seeing fish decreasing in the seas and birds decreasing across the earth. So the fourfold taxonomy, if you remember that I mentioned earlier on, is mandated by God to multiply and disperse across the earth, not just humans, okay? It is for all creation to multiply and flourish. But as we know, when sin enters the picture in Genesis 3, when humankind <laughs> begins to choose its own way and not God's because it's a choice, we begin to see examples throughout the Old Testament where humankind resists this mandate. <coughs> it resists diversity. And what do I mean? Well, let's take a look at the story of the Tower of Babel. And here's a, a nice image of it. And, and, and there it is. And we're, and we're going to look at this passage really quickly. Um, and notice in the picture, by the way, it's not just a, a tower, but it's like a city within walls. And, and you'll see why that's important. Now, the whole world had one language and common speech. And I want to say that a common speech is different from a common voice. OK, a common speech means speaking the exact same words. A common voice recognizes our different tones and voice uh, um, and characteristics, but have the same um, belief. Anyway, as people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. So this is after sin has entered the world. And they say to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city. So a city first with a tower that reaches to the heavens <coughs> so we can make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we'll be scattered over the face of the whole earth. So we don't want to be scattered across the face of the whole earth. But isn't that what the original mandate was? Let us carry on. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. And the Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language, they've begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us come down and confuse their language so they won't understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth. They stopped building the city. And that is why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. And from there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. So in Genesis 11, and again, I mentioned at the very beginning, we need to kind of be familiar with scripture if we're going to say something of worth to biodiversity. In Genesis 11, we read that out of fear of dispersion, humankind disobey God's mandate. And instead, they attempt to solidify themselves. They build a city and a tower. And from the text, it appears that they have the same language or the same words. And the problem with this is that it is not unity. It is not unity that they have. But, <coughs> excuse me, but uniformity. And God finds this unanimity alarming because total uniformity, which is the opposite of diversity, is a sign of totalitarian control. And we can infer this because the builders, if you look at the text, refuse to let anyone leave the city. They say, and I like the old language would say lest, lest or otherwise we'll be scattered over the whole earth. All right. 
So they want everyone, and I would argue everything, to think, behave the same way. They're going to keep them incarcerated in the city. That's why I mentioned taking note of a city, not just a tower. Um, they want to keep them incarcerated if they don't. There's no space for difference here. Now, interestingly, when Paul, later on in the epistles, writes about creation crying out in Romans, we often have this picture of just kind of like creation crying out, waiting for God to return, right? That's been my understanding of it for many years. Um, but I was at a conference recently at LST and the speaker um, suggested, and I think this is very profound, he said that Paul wasn't writing about creation just groaning and calling out in a general way to God, which is how I've understood it. But you can see Paul's writing those words in relation to his comments on idolatry. And he argues that the created things are crying out to God when they are used for purposes contrary to the worship and glory of God. Remember in Psalm 104, we were talking about the importance of being one worshipping theocentric community. And so you can imagine that even the materials being used in the construction of this tower and walls, which are to keep people locked in, they are crying out to God to be liberated from this perverse use for what they're not, it's idolatrous. That is why the created things are calling out and not being used for what they're intended to be, which is to worship God. They're being used <laughs> to keep people locked up. And I think that says a powerful thing, the things of, of consumership as well. You know, of all of the things I buy that, that destroy the world or take away people's livelihoods, you know, maybe my iPhone, maybe the silicon in my iPhone is crying out to God to be used for something positive, not something that leads to the death and lack in others. So what does God do? Well, he challenges this resistance by disrupting the human effort and dispersing people into nations with different languages. So remember the original mandate in Genesis 1 to multiply and disperse. Well, here, God disrupts the human project and disperses them again. And it is a divine act of subversion. <coughs> Excuse me. And what's interesting is that no names are mentioned in the story of Babel. There are no names because there are no individuals. And this is ironic, especially ironic and tragic in light of the people's express wish. And you can see it in verse four to make a name for themselves. But there are no names because of the regime of they've created. Can you see the irony being painted by the author here? Oops. Now, immediately before the story of Babel, we read a long genealogy of Noah's, Noah's various children and then their children and children after them. So we're bombarded with names in Genesis 10. And remember, the story of Noah is one in which a Christ-like figure, Noah, preserves all living creatures by diversity on the ark. He doesn't do it because it benefits him, but the author was writing it, I believe, to communicate that God cares and wants to preserve all biodiversity. Okay, that's chapter 10. And then after our chapter in chapter 12, there comes, uh, after Babel, there comes another long genealogy and another proliferation of names. And to add irony on top of irony, this second genealogy starts by saying the words, this is the line of Noah's son, Shem. That's chapter 11, verse 10. And Shem literally means name in Hebrew. So God wants to know each one of us, including all created things, by name. Remember the lengthy taxonomies and so forth. He wants us to see one another face to face for each one of us to be known. And yet the story of Babel is an assault on God and an attack on human and by extension, creaturely uniqueness. That is why God disrupts and disperses. So disruption and dispersion are ways in which God resists the human effort to, ma to maintain identity and continuity through institutionalizing the experience of God. Disruption and dispersion are the ways in which God tears down the barriers that keep us from, and here we are, um, worshipping 
together. Remember, I was talking about that theophany, that theocentric view of which to look at us and creation, that shared choir, that common voice, praising God, being used for what he created us to be used for. And as I saw in the reflection on Psalm 104 and what Ray shared uh, briefly from 1 Corinthians, we are to be a theocentric community of creation. This is how our faith can intersect conversations pertaining to biodiversity. And I mentioned racial justice, but as I've gone through this, you can you can read into how this hermeneutic, you know, can talk into matters of racial justice. But equally, we can see how this hermeneutic talks about biodiversity um, as well. We need to break down the barriers that divide us and cause us to use one another as God didn't intend. Of course, the most significant uh, moment of disruption and dispersion is found in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Bible is about this good news. And this is God's final rejection of centricism. In him, as Ray said, there is no longer Jew or Gentile. The cross was not simply God's judgment on the sins of the world, although it did do that. It was God's judgment on any form of institutionalized religion or corporate way of managing the world's resources or way of doing worship that seek to exclude the foreigner, foreigner. And that can refer to creatures belonging to the created order as well, which we see foreign to ourselves with a more enlightenment mindset that needs to be turned around. We need to recognize the intrinsic value of creation's biodiversity. And as Christians, we need to give voice to creation in all its glorious biodiversity. So for those of you who don't know, I'm an ordained Anglican priest, and I'm going to be really uh, geeky and intersect this with the marks of mission, right? But the first mark of mission is to proclaim the gospel. And I think the fourth or fifth one is about creation care. But we need to proclaim, we need to give voice for creation when no one's listening to it for the sake of the mission of God the Missio Dei, and for the church. I want to end this reflection by reading a quote from the former Archbishop of Hong Kong. So um, I wasn't, oh, I was born in the UK, but I, I've spent most of my life living and working um, in Hong Kong. And I want to quote the former Archbishop, um, Paul Kwong, who often described the church, and I think this is a beautiful way to describe it, as a new community becoming into being a new community becoming into being. And today's sustaining conversation is titled Diversity and Community in Nature. And Archbishop Kwong says this, the building up of this new community is an essential part of the mission of the church who needs to hear God's voice speaking through the experience and perspectives of those whose identities are contested or denied. I would say that creation's identity and, and intrinsic value is completely denied all right we need to hear it um, carrying on sharing god's loving and embracing presence draws us of necessity into building up of a sustainable community where all can have different identities so that's for diversity but be able to live together in harmony uh, praising him uh, i would add so I hope that provides just a few uh, thoughts um, about how we can be, be really bold about proclaiming the good news of the gospel into even some of the more recent and new conversations pertaining to the environment, such as um, biodiversity. And I'm gonna hand back to Ray, who has a beautiful, I believe, um, piece to, to share with us now. Yeah, thank you, Mark, again. So just before the, the sharing, um, Peter Harris uh, shared uh, me with his insight about the diversity in community and the nature. He said that uh, while we are living a current crisis throughout creation, we can bring it to bring to its own particular hope and uh, our own particular gifts. Only by flourishing to get together in all our differences, just as nature itself does in its community of life, can we find hope. Only by 
flourishing together in all our differences, just by nature itself, thus in its community of life, can we find hope. Thank you. Hope you enjoy the talk. Thank you, uh, Mark and Ray. That was amazing. Um, so much to think about in the process. Um, we just want to kind of have a little time discussion now. We've got about maybe 15 minutes um, to kind of go deeper on this and ask you questions. So um, we we're small enough now where you could either unmute and just ask a question or put it in the chat and uh, we can ask it for you that way as well. So the floor is kind of open um, to ask any questions of both uh, uh, Mark and Ray. If you don't have a question, maybe some thoughts that may have been triggered or, or something that you might want to share as well would be, would be really great to hear. I think I can see someone attempting an unmute. <laughs> Uh -huh. uh, um, it did. Uh, I, it did make me think about uh, what Joseph Stalin said: that um, the death of an individual man is a matter of consequence and pathos. The death of a million men is just a matter of statistics. And um, just just thinking that way that you can get regimes who will throw millions of men into a war for the individual leader to be maintaining his greatness, whereas the individuality ceases to matter with that sort of regime. That's great. If, can we respond to uh, I, that? Yeah, wow, thanks. When you said to quote Joseph Stalin, I was like, oh no, where are we gonna go with that? But no, that, that is so true, isn't it? What, what you just said, it's so much, it's so much easier to depersonalize people when you see them as one large monolith. And actually, I, um, I'm part of a group called CARG, which stands for Campaign Against Racism Group, which campaigns on behalf of East and Southeast Asians. And actually, one of the things um, that faces this particular community is the way in which the media often um, kind of monoliths people who look East Asian uh, in, in the way that they report and use images so that I think, yeah, people are dehumanized as a large group. And yeah, no, I really thank you for, for really um, draw, drawing, drawing us to that with, with that quote. It's, it's so true, isn't it? And how do we as the church um, help bring a face to one another, but also creation? I think in terms of getting to know the other, I think it's by getting to know one another. It's only when we get to know the other that we see them made in the image of God, that we see their face, we see their name. But trickier to do with creation. Would, would love to know if anyone has any suggestions about how we can help people not treat creation as just some, like, like the Amazon rainforest, right? And I always, I guess I, maybe I've quoted it a number of times here, but the impact of Norman Worsba's writing on this, um, he's written quite a lot on, on kind of this um, lost images. Um, so I've mentioned it here before, I think, where um, I think he's expanded in his latest book as well, which I forgot the name of. My wife's really enjoying it. But he talks about the how we've lost this image of nature and creation because we're, we've created a uh, a way for us to be able to exist without, for instance, um, knowing where our food comes from, knowing miles, knowing we don't have to, we don't have to grow a carrot to be able to eat a carrot, right? We don't have to feed chickens to eat chicken. Um, and so because it's, we've lost that image, then we have to kind of consume more. It's harder for us to exist with this lost image. So we have to commodify nature 
and in our minds subdue it in order to kind of control it. His argument then is that if we lose nature and we commodify it, then we lose the image of, of people and we commodify people. And his argument is that's why we can consume so much in the West to the detriment of other countries because um, we've lost their image as much as we've lost the image of creation. And so he, his argument, I think he then he would go is that, um, that the journey then is to be able to, is to re find both the image of creation and communities and people. So um, it becomes a radical act, putting your head in the soil and engaging with nature when it's um, no longer something that is just uh, for your commodity, is not just commodified, but is again, this kind of, um, as Ray said in his quote, this godly context in which our hope lies. Um, yeah, so that's just some thoughts from really just repeating Wurzba. Um, when I first came to this neck of the woods, um, I, I moved from a city. I was living in Cardiff, and now I'm in West Wales. And for a year, I didn't seek out another church. I didn't go to church. I got a five-acre field, and I spent a year just spending time with me and God in a five-acre field, <laughs> watching things grow. And... It was, um, it's a revelation just how much uh, creation screams out what God is like if you take the time to spend watching the weeks of a plant germinating from a seed and growing and then the, the leaf buds and then the flower buds and then the the fruiting bodies, the nuts, the seeds, whatever. Um, it's, it's something you just don't get with an hour long watching Attenborough or something. It's the time, it's the detail, it's the smell, it's the movement of everything. And um, Christ embodied the word of God, the word of God, the communication, two-way thing, communication of God the author of creation to communicate God. And it's something I don't believe you get if you spend all your time indoors reading the Bible. You need to get out and actually live with creation to see it working, to get that aspect of what God is like. And of course, if you get to know it with that intimacy, then you get more concern about it rather than just, well, yeah, let's go and protest or something because someone said that this ought to be a good thing. It's, it's more of a personal matter living with what God has created as it lives. just want to pick up on the last thing you said there, because I think it's uh, very interesting. You said it's important for us to get really intimate with creation, otherwise we end up just protesting. Is, is it your view or experience that these days there are many people protesting who aren't necessarily um, intimate with creation? Like, I'd love to get your perspectives on that. I just picked it up at the end. Okay, there's one, one thing that annoys me these days is the idea of veganism. Um, not using animals at all, you know, not exploiting them or whatever. Um, and yet life and death are intricately related in creation. I mean, I'm, I'm in the future, once my nut trees get bigger, I'm going to be at war with gray squirrels. But uh, today, uh, well, the last couple of days, we've had some chickens hatch. And the, the last two, one of them, um, made a little hole a few days ago and hadn't come out. And eventually I, I helped it out because it, it, was, it was now in a sticky situation. And the other one, it died a few days ago. And I wasn't grieving over it. It was just the way things are. Some things live, some things die. Some animals we eat and some we don't. And... The idea that all life is this totally sacred thing 
at a sing, uh, you know, at every level, living being uh, has rights to live somehow. It's not the way it works. It, God didn't create it that way. Some things live a long time, some a short time, and some things we um, we cause. Well, we start off with growing and. Um, well, plants we sow and animals we breed, and some of those we kill off. I mean, gardening is a matter of life and death. Some things live, some things die. And it's this worship of individual lives must be somehow preserved. It's not always the case. And God said, uh, God puts um, murder as being the, the killing of humans, but not the killing of anything else. And I'm hearing... I'm hearing that sort of protest taking in animals as being on par with humans. And um, yeah, I, I find protesting, shouting at governments, other people to do things annoying when really I, I need to look at what I can do myself rather than what I can get other people to try. Thank and... th 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 thanks for elaborating that. I was, I was so interested. In fact, I didn't get to expound on it from Psalm 104, but... I think it was in uh, verse 29 where it says, when you take away their breath, they die and return to the dust. When you send your spirit, they are created. So very much, you know, I can get as far as to agree that yes, life and death and that cycle are part of biodiversity. And, and yeah, I think talking about death is something I think in the West, we generally have become awkward about talking about, uh, isn't it? You know, with our infatuation of youth and so forth. And again, I think if we can start bringing some of these conversations about life and death, into the public sphere and help people start thinking existentially, you know, I, I really think that, that people will start, start thinking about their existence before, before God and the finite days of their life and how they want to spend it. But John, I noticed that there's a question in the chat. Do you want to read yeah, it out? Let me um, read it from, um, there's one from uh, Lucy and then Nikki's just written one as well. So let me read the one from um, Lucy. So her question is around globalization. And she says, um, uh, I think one of I think for me one of the questions raised is around glo globalism and how to extract the goodness from the goodness from celebration of one another, one's foods, one's cultures, one's crops, without abusing and misusing one another, and the offering of nature around the world. Any thoughts on that, Mark Ray? Yeah, thanks, Lucy. Um, it is definitely a, a very important and uh, um, interesting question. Uh, uh, recently, I'm, uh, it happens that I'm, I'm actually looking into the globalization and the creation care in relation to the food, um, food issues. So uh, while we are enjoying all those abundant provision of uh, local foods. Um, we also cherish um, that we can grow and we can we, we can obtain from local farmers. We also appreciate and enjoy some foods um, from foreign lands, from other places, other parts of the world. Uh, it, it, re it reminds me that in in, in the Bible, God, God actually provides um, abundant uh, resources and, uh, and food for us to, to enjoy. Uh, at the same time, God also reminded us all those, all those created, uh, we, need to, we need to give thanks to the creator. And that we needed to, yeah, support and help each other considering there are also poverty is ongoing and there are people are short of food mm. yeah that's I've got, my thought i've got a quick response as well thanks for that ray i think it's interesting that in your question you say um you know around globalism and how to extract the goodness from you know from, from a, as a culture and i think and you know i'm just being pedantic just but um but you know the word extract d defined i believe is to remove or take out especially by effort or force i just googled it so i didn't know
but I think, you know, you know, how do we get the balance? But if we are extracting or taking resources and stuff from another culture, but on our terms and not theirs, then I think there's a power imbalance there and, and a matter of justice to talk about. So, you know, I know many countries whose farmers, you know, have to work and toil to sell produce, bananas, cocoa, and make next to no profit, paying off debts that their countries incurred, perhaps due to an unfair deal set up in the past between our countries and theirs. And so again, I think this is where it intersects with those questions. Whereas if a country, you know, is, is more of a fair trading partner and feels like they can do this, and I think it's fair, um, is one thing I, I suppose we, we, we can consider. And the other thing I think is, you know, I, I, I often argue that um, when humanity was betrayed in Genesis, it was to be a royal gardener. You know, um, in, in Genesis, I think it's five, it says there was no shrub or plant on the ground because God had not sent the rain and had made humanity. So this suggests that creation wouldn't be better off without humanity, which some fundamental environmentalists believe, which can lead to devaluing human life. Because they're like, we're a scourge on the planet. And I think that goes to what P Peter was saying. We need to avoid that. But actually it's saying God created humanity because he designed us to help co-create with him and so forth. And we see Jesus being resurrected in the garden and so forth. So ergo all to say, if that is the image uh, that is on us as Christians to be co-creators as gardeners, if we therefore remove that image from another by not letting them garden in a way that helps them live well with creation, if they're forced to employ industrial methods just to try and pay off for debts, then we are st preventing them from, from, from imaging God as gardeners. So again, that's another angle to bring into when we're asking about, is this particular company the way that they're extracting from this, you know, that's why fair trade is so important, basically. <laughs> um, but I think there's some theological ways that we can kind of wrestle with it as we try and discern a way forward. Yeah, um, just to kind of, I really appreciate that. And I think I'm um, just kind of wrap up now as we're just at time. Um, kind of bouncing off what you're just talking about in that question as well, is um, kind of coming back to permaculture principles, which I find have been really helpful. So um, we went to, I went on an Arasha retreat and um, I've been kind of, was kind of thinking of these and finding why does, why does it feel like so much of the net zero chat feels, rings hollow to me? Like, I know it's important, but why do I, why do I struggle to like get so excited about it? And I think um, um, we watched this movie about different people that had done permaculture things in their land and orchestrated kind of permaculture principles. And one, one chap said that if we only think about this, um, the issue of climate emergency as we're at fault, we have to reduce ourselves. At the natural conclusion is it'd be better if we didn't exist on this planet. And he goes, but actually, I think with permaculture, instead of having to reduce our carbon, it's about storing and creating beautiful, wonderful spaces in which carbon is stored and creating spaces in which um, nature and human humanity flourishes together. And to me, that's much more exciting to get behind than just the reduction. Do you know what I mean? Like um, that all of a sudden becomes something really wonderful and amazing. I think that is kind of the heart behind and what Nikki's written here too in her quote. She said, she wrote in, in the chat, uh, we cannot protect something we do not love. We cannot love what we do not know and we cannot know what we do not see and touch and hear. And I think that's a great way for us to kind of, with that quote and that thought maybe sums up what we're trying to do with potty shed and sustaining conversations and is a great way to end this year is that um the the bottom line is that we can't care for the world without getting our hands in the soil we can't um reach net zero or anything else without getting our hands in the soil and we have we've got to we've got to get our hands dirty and that's just um the only way we can reimagine and fall in love with creation again and creator all right. Well, that's uh, that's us done. That's just a thought. Um, uh, man, it's been such a wonderful time. Uh, and thank you so much, Mark and Ray. Fantastic. Um, I've only got really one announcement, and I'm going to put it in the chat here. And that is for our summer conference, uh, which is kind of where these conversations come out of. 
we've got an absolutely wonderful group of speakers lined up that are really uh, diverse. And it's these type of topics that we'll be really uh, doing a deep dive on. And because I'm the organizer of the conference, one of them with a the team, I also get to see the, the papers that have been submitted and the people that we've invited as well. And I have to tell you, it's gonna get really, it's gonna be really exciting. Um, there's some really wonderful um, papers and things happening. And um, so I just encourage you to get on there, grab some tickets, come along. We'll also um, put everything, um, we'll record things and put them on YouTube as well. So we can kind of continue to create this database of conversations that hopefully can inspire beyond just the date as well. So um, yeah, with that, I just want to, I want to thank you everyone. I want to especially thank Lucy as well, who has helped uh, work so hard on all of this with me and we've done it together and it's been an absolute joy working with Lucy. And um, so big thanks to Lucy as well for everything with these, um, especially with Potting Shed. Um, we're going to be back and watch this space. We're going to do some more Potting Shed, I think. Um, and uh, I think we've got some creative and fun ideas about how we can do that moving forward as well. So everyone, thanks so much and have a very good night. Great. Hey, John, can you stop the recording a second? I wanted to yeah. ask Pete, Peter which part of West Wales he's in because my yes, family are in West Wales. Now. Good call. I have to find the recording.